Hi, I'm Marius from MWays Photography, and welcome back to the second part of the second season of Digital Photography Today, the show where you will learn how to become the master of your camera. Now this week we take on a much discussed topic, which is RAW versus JPEG. If you don't know what RAW is, it will be explained in this episode. Okay, so what happens when you press the shutter button and you take an image? Your camera sensor records RAW data. What happens after this depends on how you have set up your camera to either shoot only RAW or only in JPEG or RAW plus JPEG. Now most people use or prefer JPEGs. So after your camera has recorded the RAW information and you have chosen to shoot in JPEG files, your camera starts to do some processing. Let's call this in-camera photoshopping if you like. It will now look at the chosen white balance you have selected, your sharpness, tonality and color settings. It then applies all those settings to the raw information and saves a JPEG file. The rest of the raw information gets chucked away. If you choose raw instead of JPEG, the camera saves all this raw information into one file, which you can then edit in a program like Adobe's Photoshop Lightroom or Adobe ACR, which is also known as Adobe Camera Raw. There are also some other programs, some free programs as well on the market, but these are the most well known. You will not be able to open the RAW file on your computer without these dedicated software. Now within this RAW file is also an embedded JPEG file for previewing. Now shooting in RAW will allow you to decide the way you want to post-process your image and not the way the camera decides when shooting in JPEG. I will show you an example on Lightroom soon. Okay, why would someone decide to shoot RAW plus JPEG? In this mode, the camera saves two files, the RAW file as well as a JPEG file with all the adjustments like white balance and color settings applied to this JPEG file. Shooting in this mode will take up a lot of space and slow down your camera. So if you are shooting in burst mode, know that your camera buffer will fill up very quickly. If you have watched my older episodes, you will notice my camera is set to RAW plus JPEG. Now the only reason for this is that I'm shooting with an iFi card. If you look at my camera, you will see I have two card slots. The first 64-bit card holds all my RAW files. The second 8GB iFi card or the Wi-Fi card holds all my JPEGs. These JPEGs are sent to my tablet, so I have all my images on my device wherever I am. Now I delete these JPEGs on the iFi card eventually. The RAW files go to my desktop PC where I'm editing them on Lightroom. Now I'm not always shooting RAW plus JPEG. A lot of the time or most of the time I'm actually just shooting RAW. And then I've got two 64 um, gigabyte cards in there, especially on a wedding. Then I set my camera to shoot plus backup. So it's saving two sets of those raw files just in case something goes wrong. I definitely do not want to, want to disappoint my clients. So then I shoot um, backup as well. Now, many photographers struggle to decide if they need to shoot on raw or JPEG. This will depend on the photographer and the way you shoot. There are plus and minus points to both raw and JPEG. If you find yourself shooting on the go and you don't have time to edit, then JPEG is definitely the answer. You then need to make sure your exposure is correct and assign the correct white balance to your lighting conditions. That way you make sure you get the best quality JPEG file. And when we look at today's digital cameras, the quality of JPEGs are more than good enough. If you shoot a lot in burst mode, then JPEG is also a good choice because your camera's buffer will not fill up as quickly. If you need to print on the spot where you are shooting, this may, may be a venue or a function you're at. Again, JPEG is the way to go. Where raw files really shine is where your work becomes critical and you want ultimate control of your final product. For me, that is when I'm doing a wedding or shooting an on-location shoot. I don't have to worry about my white balance and I can focus more on the, on the job at hand and focus on my shoot. Shooting raw does not mean you can make a lot of mistakes. It's, it's still very important to get the exposure right and save the best RAW file possible. So are there downsides to shooting RAW? Definitely yes. The file sizes are a lot bigger, so you need more storage, but that has become a lot cheaper these days. Every camera has got its own RAW files. For instance, my Nikon camera has got an NEF file, uh, my Canon camera has got CR2, and my Fuji system has got um, the rough files, RAF. So if you buy a new camera, you won't be able to open those RAW files unless you have the latest editing software. 
So then the only other thing you can do is convert those images or those raw files to DNG files, which is Adobe's own raw format, making your raw files more future proof. You need to keep in mind that maybe in 10 to 20 years time, you won't be able to open your raw files, but you'll still be able to open your JPEGs, um, which is a standard format. Now, like I said, every camera has got its own raw file system. So usually when the camera comes out, you'll notice your editing software might not be able to open it. But usually at the moment they've released a new update, you'll be able to open those files again. Okay, so how I work around this is that I edit the shoot and then save the final high res JPEGs. But then I keep all those raw files for a while. But after like a few years, if I find all my terabytes of hard drive space is running low, I then look at my older shoot and ask myself if I've ever need to go back to these images. Then I delete the raw files, but I keep the JPEGs. So I don't really worry about in the next few years if I might not be able to open those raw files. It's only that I want to know that when I did that wedding or when I did that on location shoot, that I've got the best quality files possible. And then eventually I'll delete those raw files, but I always keep my JPEG images and those I keep backed up on a server. And I also have an, uh, another uh, extra location about say, 10 or 15 kilometers away from a house where I also store all my images. I know I've got my locations on three, or all my files on three locations. Okay, so you also cannot print your raw files at a photo lab or send it over to a friend who doesn't have any raw processing software. You need to first make a JPEG file. So as you can see, there are also some downsides to using raw files as well. They're not as flexible as JPEGs. Okay, so let's look at a few examples on Lightroom. Now what I've done is I've taken an image of a gray card and then I've added a cloth to the side. So the gray card is that we can select the white balance and then I've intentionally overexposed the image if you look right here. I've intentionally overexposed it by two full stops and then on this one I underexpose it by three stops. So normally you would not want to shoot to this extreme but I want to show you how much quality you can still get from your raw files compared to your JPEGs. And in some situations, your JPEG is still fine, but in others not. So by doing this, I can show you the information you need to make an educated guess. Because really, between raw and JPEG, that discussion just keeps on going on and on and on. Because people prefer, some people prefer to shoot JPEG, other people prefer to, sh to shoot raw. I'm not going to make the decision for you. I'm going to try and show you information that you can decide for yourself. Okay, then I also went to my white balance settings and then I shot the image with a Kelvin of 2500 and then also on this one I shot at a Kelvin of 10,000. That's why this image is so blue or so cool and this one is so warm. Then you'll notice if you look at the top here the wording says JPEG and on this one it says RAW. I had to add those words otherwise um, Lightroom will only have chosen the RAW files it would have ignored the JPEGs. So I had to add the words in there so the program actually imported all of them. Now, before we start with the white balance, I first want to show you how much more um, settings you've got when you shoot RAW compared to JPEG when we get um, to the white balance side. So if you go here to As Shot, this is now the RAW file, you'll see here under As Shot, I've got all the white balances and I can choose which one I want. Or I can use this white balance selector, which really works great. And then I've got the Kelvin scale here. So I can work out the Kelvin on this as well. And then I've got the tint, which has got the normal plus one, plus two, plus three, and minus one, two, three, etc. Now, when you go to the JPEG, this really changes a lot. If you go to As Shot, you've only got As Shot, Auto, Custom. And then with the temperature, you'll notice here, you've only got a plus and a minus. You don't have the tint, or ugh, not the tint, the temp, uh, uh, the Kelvin, sorry, the word's Kelvin you did not have all the Kelvin numbers right here. You have to work with the plus minus. So when you try and recover an image like this, keep in mind that your JPEG file is limited and there's only so much you can recover from it. Okay, so I'm just gonna reset this image and then let's start with the raw file. I'm gonna use the white balance selector. You'll notice when you look at this image right here, you can see the, the yellow cast but the moment you move the selector onto the gray card, you can see right there it updates and now it's showing you what it's gonna look like. So I'm gonna click here. Now the white balance is fixed on this image. You can see it looks a lot better. If I go to the JPEG file, you'll be surprised that there's still actually a lot you can recover from 
a very orange type white balance. But when we start to zoom in and look at the detail, you'll notice this is what we are getting from the JPEG, where when I go to the raw file, just look at this. The color and the detail, um, the tonality on it, just look at the, the whites are more white on the raw, and it's just there's just a lot more detail on this compared to this. So we did lose a lot, but surprisingly, we could still recover a lot from the JPEG. But I would definitely prefer to have this. Then if I go to the cooler side, this is where we really open a whole new can of worms. So if I use the selector, this is, as you can see, we've got the white balance fixed. If I go over to the JPEG file, this is going to look really terrible. So you'll notice if you click on it, we've really lost a lot of detail compared to the raw file, which when we move it here, looks the same as on the other one. That's why when the raw files, your white balance is a lot more flexible. So if you're doing something very critical and you want to make sure your white balance are going to be perfect, you can always use a gray card. There's lots of other tools as well that you can use that you bring into your shot. And then when you get to post-processing like this, you can fine tune your white balance perfectly. Okay, so let's go to the underexposed side. And what I'm gonna do is this was underexposed by three stops. So I'm gonna to go to the exposure slider and I'm gonna to go to the plus side and I'm gonna to go to around plus three. And on this one, I'm also gonna to go to around plus three. Now, if you look at the two images, if you look at that and that, you'll notice that the JPEG actually almost looks better. Now, the reason for that is, remember, with the JPEG file, the in-camera process processing has already started to do some sharpening and some other stuff as well. This raw file is now still completely raw. So the only thing I've done is I've overexposed the image. So this is what the raw file looks like, and this is what the JPEG looks like. So when you are shooting the raw file, you're still going to have to do some other processing stuff here to make this look really good. But you'll notice you can still recover more um, detail in the end. But with a JPEG, um, I've actually shot something where my flash didn't go off as it was intended to. And then I was able to recover a lot of detail from a raw file alone. I didn't even have a raw file. Uh, not a raw file, the JPEG file. I could still recover a lot from the JPEG file because I didn't shoot that image in RAW. So if you underexpose, you can still recover a lot. But where it becomes really very um, tricky is when you overexpose. So if I take this image, and then this one was two stops, uh, full stops overexposed. So I'm going to underexpose this. And then I'm going to take this one and underexpose it as well. Now, if you look at this, this looks terrible. Just look at the detail we've got there compared to the detail we've got here. If you look at this image and you look at the one that was shot perfectly, you'll notice there's no real um, difference between these two because this one, you'll notice I didn't do anything to the image and this one was when the exposure was correct. So this one looks the same. So the nice thing about shooting in RAW is that you can recover a lot of um, overexposure. Now, where this becomes very important for me is like when I'm doing a wedding and sometimes couples decide we're going to get married outside. And then it looks really beautiful when you're there. But when you start to look at your lighting and even if you start to use your flashes correctly, you do and you, ha and you pull out all the tricks in the book to get the exposure the best you can. There are still some times when the lighting just was not in your favor. And then with this, I can really start not by just using the exposure slider, by using the highlight shadows, whites and blacks. You can really bring in all the detail. For instance, the sun maybe just fell on a, uh, on a little section of the dress uh, of the bride and then there was a little bit of blowout there. Very easy. I can bring all those detail back and you won't even know that, they, that it was blown out in the first place. So for me, this is very critical that I do have... Um, the ability to bring back highlights or blown highlights if something goes wrong. So if we recap, if you underexpose like we did here, the JPEG actually recovered pretty nicely if you compare these two. This one I'll still actually prefer over the JPEG because there's a lot more that I can do here and in the end it will look better than the JPEG. But the JPEG recovered very nicely from the, those three stops underexposed. Um, but on the highlight side, when I 
um, overexposed it, getting those details to come back. If you look at this, this is totally destroyed. There's nothing really we can do with this. But with the raw file, it recovered very nicely. And then when we look at the white balances, the blue totally destroyed it when the image was too blue, trying to fix it. And this image was shot under daylight conditions. And then this one was also shot under daylight. But having those, bringing that color back or fixing the color was, it didn't actually look that bad. This image still, the color doesn't look right on the JPEG, but I can still uh, um, fine tune it here a little. But if you look at the quality here and we compare it to the raw file, you'll notice if I just take it around, I think it was there. The raw file definitely, when we come to the white balance, looks a lot better and more accurate than a JPEG file. So when you shoot JPEG, just remember, you need to get your exposure right. You need to get your white balance right. Because JPEGs are really cool and awesome. They've got a lot of detail in there, but they need to be shot correctly. If you make a lot of mistakes, then it's going to show immediately. But when you shoot RAW, you've got a lot of, uh, how can I say, flexibility. But remember, the better you shoot the quality of the RAW file, the more you can still get out of that image later as well. Um, you can really push the sliders a lot in your RAW files. But you'll definitely be able to get a lot more from your picture if it's shot correctly. You always need to keep in mind, get the best exposure possible. You just have a lot of flexibility with your white balance. So there you don't need, really need to worry about it at all. When I'm shooting raw, I don't even set my white balance. I just leave it on auto. When I come to the processing side here in Lightroom, I set all my white balances for all my pictures. And I do use gray cards and um, uh, color selectors and stuff when I'm shooting. When I can see this is really a tricky location, I'm not really sure about my white balance. Then I bring that into one picture. And then when I get here to Lightroom, I use that, like for instance, maybe this image, I would take something like this, use this as the image to get the white balance perfect. And then I'll delete this image and then keep all the rest. Okay, so that's all for this week's episode. And in next week, week's episode, I'm going to take another topic that has been popping up all over the comment section and then also on the new um, Facebook uh, Digital Photography Today group. So if you haven't yet joined the Digital Photography Today group on Facebook, just open your Facebook and search for Digital Photography Today and you'll see the group will pop up. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion there on using Wi-Fi. And then you can use Wi-Fi on your Canon PowerShot SX50. A lot of people with the PowerShots have been asking about that. You can use Wi-Fi. I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, you'll also notice um, the way I shoot, if you look at this image right here, you'll notice that I've got two cards in my camera. So the one records all my RAW files and the other card records all my JPEGs. That's what I just talked about earlier when I talked about shooting RAW plus JPEG. This is what it looks like on for instance, one of my Nikon SLR cameras. On my Canon PowerShot, I just have one of these cards, uh, of the iFi cards plugged into the, or inserted into my Canon PowerShot and it allows me to shoot wirelessly. So in next week's episode, I'm going to show you how it works. I'm going to show you how to set it up on your tablet so that you can immediately send your pictures to your tablet. I'm also going to show you a program that you can edit your pictures on and then how to submit it to like Facebook or social media. So that's all for this week. If you have liked this episode, please be kind and subscribe to the channel and then I'll see you in next week's episode. Bye.